right, so um, what you're going to be doing today uh, is, uh, and this week or the next couple weeks, is chromatography. Um, you're going to be uh, using chromatography to analyze the reaction that you ran, um, the, to break the fetal, and you're also going to be using chromatography to purify that reaction so you get just the product that you want, none of the starting materials, and none of the time products, ideally. Okay. Um, so you're all very, uh, hopefully, pretty familiar with chromatography. So how many people have done chromatography or chromatography in high school, in like a high school lab? All right, so you probably use like a coffee filter, maybe you use silica or some other some other medium, yeah? Um, how many people have done gel electrophoresis? Awesome, so that's a type of chromatography, right? It's just a separation based upon different properties of the compound. Right, gel electrophoresis, right, it's based upon the charge uh, of the compound. Right, chromatography or the type of chromatography that we use in organic chemistry, it's based upon the interactions, the intermolecular interactions that our compound has with, with the medium that it's passing through. Right? So we're going to be focusing our efforts today to understand uh, thin layer chromatography. also seen a third type of chromatography or you've been introduced to a third type of chromatography that we can use um, to understand the other two which is gas chromatography. All right, and they all more or less operate the same way. All right, so when we when you learned about gas chromatography you learned about how molecules are injected into uh, uh, the GC, the gas chromatograph. Um, and they flow through a column, and how they interact with the packing material in that column um, is going to determine how fast they move through it, right? So if molecules are shot into this column uh, and they interact a lot with the medium inside, then that means they're going to move through it slowly, right? So if I had to move through this classroom and I had to shake everybody's hand as I move through this classroom, it's gonna take me a you know, pretty long time. If I had to move through this classroom and I only had to shake maybe five people's hands, Right, that I can move through this classroom a lot more quickly. Same thing, right? It's, it depends upon how many hands the molecules have to shake as they go through this column, right? So when we talk about a column, right, that, that term is used somewhat loosely. So this is the column. It's basically a, a glass capillary tube, um, somewhat flexible. Um, and inside that capillary tube, there's a material uh, that interacts with the organic molecules that move through and that material can vary depending upon how you want the molecules to separate or what properties um, will determine their separation, right? So do you want them to separate based upon polarity? Do you want them to separate based upon charge? Do you want them to separate based upon lipophilicity, um, chirality, right? So different properties you can choose and, and you can buy different columns with different packing materials. All right, so I'll pass this around. Just there are two clips kind of holding everything together. Um, so just make sure you're not unwinding the So gas chromatography we describe as being an uh, analytical method. Right, so we're using it just for analysis. Right, we're not expecting to recover anything that we put onto the GC, right? So anything we inject into that column, we assume uh, in order for it to be detected, it's going to be destroyed, right? And, and that's kind of nice, because usually with GCs, we only need to inject micrograms of material onto the column in order for any, any detection to take place. So we don't have to waste much of our sample. Right, and we can also say that this met method is quantitative. Right, so when we get a chromatogram, what the computer reads as stuff is coming off the column is, is they will see that material Right, it will give us these peaks. Right, and the, the axes of this graph is time and intensity or abundance. Right, 
right? So the taller the peak, the more area under the peak, the more material there is, right? The smaller the peak, the less area under the peak, the less material there is, right? So we can take these chromatograms and figure out the exact ratios of the materials that, or the mixture of materials that we shot um, into the GC, right? And that's really nice, okay? But again, it's only an analytical method. It's not actually, I mean, it's separating them, but we're not expecting to get anything on. Okay, thin layer chromatography. So pass these around. These are TLC plates. All right, one side of this TLC plate uh, is glass. You can probably feel which side is glass. All right, so it's a glass plate, and then the top side is coated with silica gel. So silica gel glass SiO2, right, is the is the molecular formula, the overall molecular formula, all right? But it's a polymeric material, right? So it's repeating units of silicon and oxygen, okay? And if you think about the silicon oxygen bond, is that a polar bond? Is that a non-polar bond? How many people think it's a polar bond, silicon oxygen? How many people think it's a non-polar bond? Okay, so, so let's, let's think about the periodic table real quick. So we have boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine. All right, so that, there's oxygen. Where's silicon built into these? Yeah, uh, right below oxygen. Right below oxygen, so that's going to be sulfur. How many, now, how many people think it's a polar bond? Okay. Two people change their mind? Yeah, so I mean, oxygen's really electronegative, right? Silicon, I mean, it's much more electronegative than carbon, right? And silicon is even less electronegative than carbon, right? So that's a, a more polar bond than a carbon oxygen bond. And that's key to, the, to how this interacts with molecules, right? That polarized silicon oxygen. Right, because we have these polar bonds, right? But what that means is that silicon is going to be uh, electron poor, right? And all these oxygens are going to be electron rich. All right. So when you think about that silicon, right, that coating on the top side of these TL TLC plates, when you think about that interacting <coughs> with other molecules, how can this interact? Or what's the major interactions that <coughs> this can have with other molecules? Intermolecular. Dipole, dipole. All right, so we could assume that the more polar the molecule, the more it's going to interact with the silicon. Right, the less polar the molecule, the less it's going to interact with the silicon. All right, any other interactions that this can have? Yeah. So I would say you could have hydrogen bonding, but like, which way does the polymer go? Like, can can you have hydrogens poking into Sure. Interact with the oxygen. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can have also you can have hydrogen bonding, but but um, specifically, this is a hydrogen bond acceptor, right? So there are no hydrogens on the oxygens here. You can have a you know acidic silicon, different, but but there are no hydrogens on on silicon oxide. So we need something with a hydroxy group and a amino group with a hydrogen. Right, in order to hydrogen bond to this. And that, and that happens, right? We see that uh, hydroxyl groups are alcohols, carboxylic acids, um, primary amines, they interact a lot with the silicon, they stick a lot to the silicon, not just because of the polarity, but because they can hydrogen bond to those oxygens. All right, so thin layer chromatography, just like gas chromatography, is also analytical. It tells us if we run TLC, if we can figure out roughly how many how many things are in a mixture of organic molecules. Right. So let's think about, or I want to explain how TLC works functionally. What we're doing.
Okay, so this is TLC plate. Okay, and we're gonna focus on the side with the silicon coating on it, right? The glass side is just to support. Right, what you're gonna do uh, is you're going to get your TLC plate and you're going to draw a pencil line across the bottom of the plate, about half a centimeter to a centimeter, uh, right? Not very far off, pretty near the bottom. Okay, and this is all, all this is do, going to do is serve as a reference line. On this pencil line, you're going to take a little capillary tube, right? You're gonna, you're gonna take that capillary tube and put a, a little bit of your sample in that capillary tube, and then you're gonna press that capillary tube to the line, and that's going to deposit some of that material in that capillary tube onto the line, just a little spot. Developing chamber, which is basically just a jar. Right, there's going to be a lid or just a uh, watch glass on the top of that jar to keep all the fumes and everything in. Right? And then in the bottom of this jar, there's going to be a small volume of salt. solvent as the eluent. Right. And what that solvent is going to do is it's going to soak into the silica gel. And then as it soaks into the silica gel, it's going to climb up the plate through capillary action. Right. So if you you know, if you uh, put a paper towel in some water, just the tip of the paper towel, right, the water's gonna climb up the paper towel, eventually the whole paper towel will be wet. Right, and as it climbs up the plate, it's going to carry your sample with it. carrying your sample with it, your sample has to move through that silica, that silica gel, right? Through intermolecular interactions, if you have different things in there with different chemical properties, different functional groups, those things are going to move through the silica gel at different rates, right? The stuff that interacts sticks really, uh, sticks a lot to the, those silicon oxygen bonds, right? That's going to move really, really slowly up the plate, right? The stuff that's not going to interact much with the silicon dioxide, Right, that's going to just be carried up the plate by the solvent. Right, so when we're done, if we have two things, or maybe say we have three things in our sample, right, maybe our plate at the end looks like that. Right? And so we're going to take it out of the jar, and then we're going to visualize it in some way. All right? So these three things, right? All three things are in this spot at the beginning. Solvent carries them up the plate, and now we have three products, right? That we have to analyze. What do we know about these three products in terms of their properties? Yeah. So I would say the topmost is probably the least. 
polar. Excellent, yeah. So least polar. Right, interacts the least with the with the substrate on the TLC plate, in this case silicon oxide. Right? And that would make the bottom spot what? Most polar. Most polar. Right? So just like GC, we're getting a view of how many things we have in our mixture. All right. What is unlike GC though? What don't we don't, what don't we figure out when we do TLC? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So, so um, it's the mass spec that does that gives us the molecular weight. Um, but yeah. So if the GC is hooked up to the MS, then uh, we can learn, learn molecular weight. Um, we don't get like any of the solvent. What do you mean by that? <laughs> what was the question? Yeah, I have more questions. So, so you know, what we learn from this is we learn how many things are in the mixture, right? What don't we learn? What more do we learn from G from GC? Uh, what the things are? I mean, what I was, what more I was getting at is, right? In GC, we can learn the exact percentages or nearly the exact percentages of each thing, right? Here, we don't learn the exact percentages, right? We just see spots. We can qualitatively say, well, this spot is bigger, so that might mean there's more material in, you know, of this spot, right, and less material of those two spots. Okay, but we can't quantitatively say there's 70% you know, of this, 15% of that, 15% of that. It doesn't, it doesn't really work that way. Yeah? So we would say that it's analytical and qualitative. Right, but it's really easy to do. So often when we run chemical reactions, particularly reactions we've never run before, we have no idea what they do, we'll monitor them by TLC, right? So every, say every 10 minutes, we'll take a TLC of the reaction to see a couple of things, right? To see if, first of all, the starting materials are disappearing, right? Also to see if there are any new things that we didn't put in there appearing in the TLC. Really easy to do, often uh, quicker, uh, less expensive than, than GC, right? But both of these work on the very same principles, right? So all chromatography, you're gonna need three things. You need the stationary phase, This is the silicon oxide. Right? The medium of the sample must move. Okay? In the GC columns, right, in these columns, like I said, it can be silicon oxide. So I think this is this is some form of silicon oxide in this one. Um, but if you can put any number of things depending upon what properties you're trying to, to separate. Okay, we have the mobile phase. Okay, in um, GC, the mobile phase is gas. Okay, so as we put that stuff into the gas chromatograph, it's gonna vaporize. And then we have you know, helium, or nitrogen or hydrogen that pushes that material through the column, right? And kind of forces it to interact with, with the stationary phase, right? And in TLC, it's the solvent, right? Or the eluent. Right? And then uh, the third thing that you have is the analyte. Sorry, the mobile phase is the um, fluid that pushes the sample through the stationary phase. All right, and then the third thing that we have is the analyte. And that's just whatever sample we try to analyze. OK, 
right? You can change these, right? Like I said, you can change the stationary phase, you can have different materials, you can change the mobile phase, do gas chromatography, it's gas, TLC, you can use all sorts of different solvents. But it works all the same. So for TLC, if it's if you're using uh, silicon, is it dioxide? Just yeah, silica okay. or silica or dioxide. Yeah. Would, why would you ever use like a non-polar LUN? Like, or sorry, why would you ever use a polar LUN? Would you always have a, a non-polar mobile phase and a and a polar? Yeah. Phase? So, so I, that that's kind of what we're going to get into next, right? Oh. We're going to talk. We're going to talk about the, the mobile phase. So we, you know, we thought about how the material interacts with the stationary phase. Right, but we also have to talk about how the mobile phase plays a role. Right, and so the you're going to be doing this today. The solvent system that you're going to be using today is going to be a mixture of hexanes. Right, hexanes is just a mixture of the different hexane hexane isomers and ethyl acid. Right, so it's a, a combination of two solvents, right? And this is not unusual. A lot of a lot of organic chemistry chromatography is is run using a combination of two solvents, right? And those solvents are going to have contrasting properties. So in this case, the hexane is, is the nonpolar solvent, right? And ethyl acetate, relative to hexanes, is the polar. And we do this because we can use the combination of the two solvents to adjust the over, overall polarity of the LUN. Right? And that's, that's important, right? Because the LUN is going to play a role in how fast these spots move through the material. Right? So you can think of these TLC plates as having millions and millions of little sites that polar molecules can stick to, right? So the, you know, they're just all the oxygens or all these polar sites that polar molecules will stick to as they move through the silicon gel, right? The solvents that we're using are also, also organic molecules, right? Also have, have properties of being polar or non-polar, okay? And so they too can stick to those same sites. And so in a way, it's a competition between the ethyl acetate, right, the polar solvent, and the polar molecules that we want to control as they move through, through the solvent. So the more polar the solvent, right, the more competition those molecules have and the more they're going to be pushed out. So the more polar the solvent, the more these spots are gonna move up the plate. Right, so if we ran this plate in 100% ethyl acetate, Right? These spots would be not spread out on the plate, right? but they would be crowded at the top. We would basically take in all three spots right, and move them through the top because our solvent is so polar that none of them really get a chance to interact with the silica gel themselves. Right? Likewise, if we ran this plate in hexanes, right? hexanes doesn't really stick to silica. There are no overly polar parts of hexanes. And so in that case, Right, our stuff is just going to stay at the bottom of the plate, right? It's just going to stay stuck to the bottom of the plate, and all the hexanes is just going to move straight up the plate, right? Because there's nothing pushing that material off the plate, off that spot, right? And so by using this combination, we can adjust the polarity, and that's what you're going to be doing today, right? So we ran this reaction, or you guys ran this reaction a couple of weeks ago. top formation reaction a couple of weeks ago, we worked it up, and we got the crude sample in a vial. So what you're going to be doing today is you're going to be analyzing that sample. You're going to be figuring out if we made product, 
if that product is clean, if there's any other stuff in the reaction. All right? You don't know what solvent system to use to analyze this. All right? I'm going to have you start with a solvent system of one, one to one hexanes to F elastic. Right? It's a good, it's a good starting point. Because at that point, you know if the spots are too high or if the spot that you really want to visualize is too high, right, then you need to decrease the amount of ethyl acetate, right, increase the amount of hexanes. The spots are too low if they don't move off the bottom of the baseline, right, then you need to increase the amount of the polar solvent, the ethyl acetate, right, decrease the amount of the um, polar solvent. So in addition to this, are we also running our sample through the IR and PCMS? So after... Not today, no. So after you purify this compound, so column chromatography, which we talk about in a second. So this is purifying. This is not pure. This is analyzing. Yeah. Right? This is an analytical method. Yeah. So column chromatography is a preparative method, right? So we expect to get material off the other side. Okay, so after we purify with column chromatography, then we'll do analysis. Right? Because if you try to do analysis on a crude, crude sample, that's, that's completely viable. A lot of people do that. Um, but for you, just, just learning NMR, it's going to be a pretty complex NMR. NMR is going to be a lot of purity peaks and hard to digest. Right? So um, we're going to purify first and then look to see how pure it is. And what it's doing. Other questions? Okay, yeah, so you're going to be playing around today. You're going to start with one to one hexane to ethyl acetate. And you want to find a solvent system that that gives you an RF, which it stands for retention factor. All right, an RF of zero point two to zero point four. All right, the retention factor, all that. All that means, all that is, is the uh, distance of the spot. So the distance that a spot moves divided by the distance that the solvent moves. Right? And so when we look at that on this TLC plate, right, if we're measuring the RF of this of this blue dot. Measuring from the line, right, the pencil line, not from the bottom of the plate. And we're measuring then to the spot where the, the where the solvent moved to, right, not to the top of the plate, right. So whenever you run these plates, you want to take the plate out before the solvent gets to the top. Right? You don't want to take it out too early, right. You want the solvent to get maybe 95% of the way up the plate. But you still want to see that there is some of the plate that the solvent hasn't touched. If the solvent gets all the way to the top of the plate, right, you don't know how long that plate was sitting in the solvent, right? It could have been sitting in there for an extra 10 seconds, it could have been sitting in there for an extra two minutes. And that matters, right? Because that's going to affect the position of the spots, it's gonna affect how concentrated or diffuse they are, right? So just make sure you're taking the plate out. Whenever you take the plate out, you're gonna use tweezers, right? Put the plate in, take the plate out. You're gonna take your tweezers and you're gonna just make a little scratch or an etch across the plate, right? You can take these plates and, and with metal tweezers, etch some of the silica off really easily, right? And you'll just make a little mark to show where, how high that solvent went, right? Because as soon as you take it out, that solvent's gonna start evaporating, so you gotta be kind of quick. So take it out, etch it, and that way you have a reference for how high the solvent went, right? So you're gonna be looking to find a solvent system that gives you an RF of our product spot at 0.2 to 0.4, all right? And I'll show you which is our product spot once you run your first TLC. Questions so far? 
Nobody has any questions? How are you guys going to see the spots? How are you guys going to see the materials? What's that? I said, will the dots not like, show up? No, they're organic molecules, right? Mm -hmm. And your samples, if you look at them, they're mostly colorless. They're a little bit yellow, maybe. But... Yeah. My, my... What? Did you say? No, yeah. he's kind of following. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said, like, uh, I'm microscope. If it's gonna be that small. It's, it's what? But how does it the dots? If it's gonna be that small, if you use a microscope. Can't use a microscope. You can't see molecules under our microscopes we have here anyway. Could we add something like colored that would, would stick to it, like a polar, like something red that's polar to stick to the polar thing? It's, it's a different like, molecule, right? So it's yeah, not sure. going to come along with, <laughs> if we're trying to you know, like, separate these things, you can't add a fourth thing and expect it to stay with the UV or something. Do any of them glow under fancy? Awesome. <laughs> Are you serious? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I like the color. I love the color. The wall works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Unger, are you saying my uh, sleepy ramblings aren't correct? <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were close. They might have been intelligible. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> might have been thinking the right thing. But. So my point asking that was that you know, one of you should have been fine. I wonder how we're going to see these spots. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Okay. So um, one of the things that our our plates have on them, embedded in the silica, is they have a, a fluorescent molecule, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to shine a black light on these plates after after we're done developing them, um, and they're going to glow green. Okay? If there's anything that's UV active that also absorbs UV, uh, UV um, light that's on the plate, it's going to prevent the fluorescer from um, glowing green, basically. It's going to absorb the light and not the plate itself. Right? And so if there's anything that is UV active, anything that absorbs in the UV, um, we should see a dark spot on the plate, and the rest of the plate will glow, glow, glow green. Glow, yeah, glow green. All right, our starting material is mildly UV active, right? So if there's an appreciable amount of starting material in your sample that did not react, you'll probably see that as, a, as either a dark green or a dark spot on the TLC plate, right? If there's a lot of it, right? or what's more likely is just a faint spot on the TLC plate. Okay, the product of this reaction is not UV active. So we're not going to be able to detect, detect it using UV light. Right? But what we can do um, is rather than putting something in there with the sample beforehand, we can take the TLC plate, right, knowing that our molecules are still on that plate, and react those molecules with something else or something after the plate has developed. Right, so the molecules are, are still, you know, after we develop the plate, those molecules are still there. And they didn't go anywhere, right? And they're just sitting on silica. So we can technically take reagents that would react with those molecules, squirt them on the same spot, and they'll react with those molecules. Right? And so the other so like the other thing that we can do is do something called staining. Right? And we're going to use a, a stain called para aldehyde. Right? And para aldehyde is just a really reactive aldehyde. Okay. Um, and para aldehyde is in a in a solution with sulfuric acid, um, ethanol. Um, and acetic acid. And this combination of chemicals uh, is really good at reacting with things that have alcohol groups, and really good at reacting with things that have um, uh, carbonyl groups to form um, molecules that are colored, basically. Right, so what we're gonna do, we have a, a jar of this thing. When our plate is developed, we're gonna look at it under the UV lamp. Right? If there's anything that is UV active, we're going to take a pencil and circle those spots right, to know that they're there. Then we're going to take that 
Um, same TLC plate, we're gonna hold it by its feet and we're gonna dunk it into some stain, torture it a little bit, pull it out, right? And then um, wipe off the glass, this paper, paper towel to get rid of the excess stain, and then we're gonna heat it up. And heating it up is just going to um, cause any reaction that will happen to happen a lot faster, right? So we're gonna apply heat just with a heat gun and if there are any, um, anything in there that reacts with the paranisaldehyde, things like this, right, things like most of the compounds you put into the reaction, right, we're gonna see them show up as dark spots or yellow spots or red spots, right, depending upon whatever the specific stain is, right? So we use both of these visualization techniques to hopefully detect anything and everything that's, that's in your crude reaction material. Okay, questions? So this week you're going to be doing column chromatography. Right? We talked about column chromatography at the beginning of the semester. Um, you're not going to be using these columns. These columns are um, expensive. We don't have a whole lot of them. Um, you're going to be, but you're going to be doing the same thing. Column chromatography functions the same way as thin layer chromatography. Right? The one difference being that co column chromatography is a preferative method. Right? Meaning that what we put onto the column, we expect to get off. Right? We're trying to collect and purify that material and get it back at the end. Right? Not just trying to figure out how many components there are, how much of the different components there are, etc. Right? But it is quantitative because we get that material off. Right? After it comes off the column, we can measure it, weigh it, etc. Right? So we can get numbers from it. But in terms of function, column chromatography functions the same way except for two aspects, right? Thin layer chromatography is just a, a, a layer, a small layer, thin layer of silica on a glass plate, right? This whole thing, this whole tube is a column right here that's a silica pad, right? Um, and so when the material moves through this column, it's going to be forced down by gravity, right? The solvent and the material will be forced down by gravity and it moves through a much bigger volume of or bigger mass of silica. Um, but in terms of the interactions, right, how the materials separate, it's going to function the same way. So what you're going to do is you're going to use the data you get from TLC today, right? The solvent system that you figure out is a good solvent system to separate the materials in your crude mixture and use that same solvent system when you run your column. You're gonna be running your columns over the next two weeks Right, so there's not, for everybody to run a column today and rotovap down their fractions and all do TLC, it's gonna be way too chaotic. Um, everybody, I think, has realized the bottleneck that the rotovaps are, right? So uh, I'm going to give you um, the opportunity to come in over the next two weeks and run your column. Um, Lab's gonna be open from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., so no, nobody can come in after 10. Um, uh, nobody can work alone, so if you come in, you have to come in with your whole group, um, and you have to also let me know when you're when you're going to come in, when you're going to be here, just so I know that that people are in the lab and people are working. Um, yeah. Uh, so are we just doing the um, TLC today and then doing the columns over the next few weeks? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. We're just doing TLC analysis today. After TL TLC analysis, we're all going to come back here. Um, and I'll show you how to set up a column, all right? How to set it up, run it, collect fractions. It'll take like five or 10 minutes, yeah. Did we do the column chromatography like very at the very beginning of lab with those three smaller samples and everything where we set up the jack and the... Something? That was not, yeah, no, that was, extra that was extraction and isolation. That was a set funnel exercise, no, no chromatography. Oh, okay, that's like the reflux and stuff and the purification. So next time we have lab, so it's going to be the Wednesday after Thanksgiving. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any other questions about the column chromatography? You can ask when we come back. So everybody's going to finish at a, a kind of a different time today. Um, when you come back here, um, there will be an NMR problem on the board relating to this product, right? For you to work on and, and, and think about. And then once everybody's finished back here, we'll get into the demonstration, column demonstration.
right? Any questions?